Okay, awesome. Welcome back, everyone. It's nine o'clock Friday morning. Uh, so due to the winter storm last year, we canceled the, the seminar last uh, Friday. And uh, I mean, the, the speaker will, uh, I think, give a talk uh, sometime in March. So today, uh, we are very honored and happy to uh, have Dr. Benjamin Sovaco here. And let me give you a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Sovaco. Uh, he's a professor of energy policy at the S Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex, Sussex Business School in the United Kingdom. There, he serves as director of the Sussex Energy Group. He's also University Distinguished Professor of Business and Social Sciences at Ars University in Denmark. Professor Salvacor works as a researcher and consultant on issues pertaining to energy policy, energy justice, energy security, climate change mitigation, and climate change adaptation. More specifically, his research focuses on renewable energy and energy efficiency, the politics of large-scale energy infrastructure, the ethics and morality of energy decisions, designing public policy to improve energy security and access to electricity, and building adaptive capacity to the consequences of climate change. So with that, uh, I'll turn the floor to uh, Dr. Benjamin Sofako. Oh, thank you so much. What a great presentation. Um, and I'm sorry, it's early Friday morning. Uh, <laughs> and it's still the afternoon here. So that's why if we did it any later, it would have been too late here in the UK. So I do apologize for the early time. Thank you for inviting me. And it's always a pleasure to come give these types of talks because I know a lot of researchers in the States don't always follow what's going on in Europe. And also I know that you do a lot of good kind of physical sciences, natural sciences work. And I thought this might be a good chance to expose you to what is considered, I guess, reasonable to good social science work. So I wanted to start, I know most of you probably have not heard of this term energy justice before, and it is very similar to other terms you might see, climate justice, environmental justice, social justice. There are even now people talking about flexibility justice and demand response justice. So really justice has become very current in discussions about energy and climate. And I think this is from a chapter a few years ago from my colleague, Darren. And it's trying to show you why energy justice has become um, so prominent. And it's because it's kind of trying to give you a multi-dimensional perspective on energy. So on the left triangle, you can see how a focus on sustainability might be narrowly interested in climate change and emissions or carbon taxes. And an approach on availability might be focused on things like security of supply or reliability, which is something that ERCOT in Texas is very concerned with. And a focus on accessibility might really be about poverty and incomes. But justice is trying to kind of situate in the middle so that you see all of those aspects, how poverty might intersect with sustainability and also interrelate with elements of availability or security. And because of that interstitial perspective, that's why the right triangle shows how it's also sitting at the nexus between these different disciplines. So a lot of energy justice work is done by interdisciplinary teams cutting across geography, economics, environmental science, political science, history, innovation studies, as well as jurisprudence and legal scholarship. So it is a, if you want a kind word, very interdisciplinary, multidimensional field. If you want an unkind word, a very sloppy, messy, uh, incoherent field at, at various times. We've tried to simplify that a bit. So we have uh, an article in Nature Energy where we tried to kind of extrapolate that energy justice is kind of four aspects of energy systems. One of them you probably study already in Texas, it's things like costs. How do energy systems generate externalities? What are their hazards? But it's not just about costs or the disbenefits of energy. We also really think it's about how fairly you can access the benefits. And this gets into things like ownership structure, gets into things like patents, intellectual property, gets into also things like how accessible new innovations are, like Tesla. I could never afford a Tesla on my salary here as a professor. So I envy those that have them. But you know, is it is it fair that some of these innovations are somewhat adopted by only high income or middle upper income communities? We also think it's about not only costs and benefits, but procedures. 
how fairly are energy decisions made, how representative or impartial is decision making, is there free prior informed consent, is there due process, is there a way that you can handle disputes, are people treated fairly, are energy decisions transparent, are they well governed? And then the final one uh, is kind of drawing from Nancy Fraser's work on energy justice as recognition or the misrecognition of injustice. And this is really about giving special attention to vulnerable groups who may not be impacted in the same way that other groups are because they have such low resilience or they have, as you would say, degraded capabilities to respond to those types of impacts. So generally, when we've done energy justice work, we've kind of applied it in two ways. One way maps a little closely to these four dimensions, and it takes these different tenets or dimensions of justice, distributive, procedure, cosmopolitan, and recognition, and it applies them to particular areas. This just gives you an example of how that is applied in a study of ours looking at electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles in the Nordic region, which is actually the third largest market for EVs after the US and China. And it has Norway, which is the world's biggest per capita user of EVs. And the other way that we've done it um, is sometimes you can offer, oh, and you can just see here, um, Kirsten Jenkins and colleagues have used that same approach as well and shown how it straddles evaluative or descriptive and normative or prescriptive elements. So it also is kind of crossing this divide of advocacy and independent scholarship. So this is the tenants approach. The other approach is the principles approach, where you can create these different principles of energy justice qualitatively, as in all energy systems or policies or pathways or decisions should meet these principles. They should enhance availability and promote equity and involve respect. And obviously this is quite a big list of principles. So it can be very challenging to find plans or technologies that meet them all. And also you can create hierarchies of principles and weight them differently. So on many of our work, we usually take a subset of principles. And so in this work, we qualitatively looked at four innovations um, for the UK, energy service contracts, uh, basically things like uh, energy as a service um, or heat as a service, EVs, solar PV, which I know you know of because you have it in Texas, and then low carbon heat, usually through heat pumps or retrofits. And we only took a subset of, of principles. You can see 10 principles here, but in this work, we only took four. Uh, and you can see how we kind of looked across those principles at positive ways. Everywhere you see a plus in the bottom table is a positive intersection with justice. And everywhere you see a, a minus is a negative intersection. And what's quite troubling is that there's no intervention that's net justice beneficial. You always see trade-offs or negatives alongside positives which maybe isn't surprising because our society is inherently unequal. So it maybe isn't surprising that energy technologies reflect that and can some sense entrench that, but it does cause pause when we think about these new innovations that we want to help revolutionize household energy use. And you can see the kind of positive and negative dimensions qualitatively explained at the, at the top of the table for, for later reading. What was quite interesting is, is two years ago, a team of Americans, actually working at Salem State and Northeastern, and I think Colorado, so not Texas, but all around the states, did this study, which I quite liked, where they created this multi-scalar justice framework. And they've called this the framework that talks about embodied energy injustices. And the argument here is that things like tons of coal or kilowatt hours have embodied in them a hidden supply chain of, of sacrifice and dispossession and injustice. And what was very troubling about their study is, is they revealed these types of injustices at multiple parts of the supply chain. And one of their critiques was that way too much of our work in the energy studies community focuses here on the square. So you see the square where it says site of combustion or production. This is where energy is used or made. So it's the wind farm or it's the household or it's the factory. And one of the problems is that's where we focus our EIAs, our environmental impact assessments, and our SEIAs. But we're by focusing only there on where it's used, we're kind of obscuring all of these other elements that we don't think about. How the things were made, how they were transported, what minerals may have been used for extraction, and where will they go at the end of their life in terms of waste and afterlife and recycling. 
Um, and so what they did is they unveiled these types of sacrifice zones for coal all across a multi-scalar supply chain reaching as far south as Columbia and as far north as West Virginia in the United States. So what we wanted to do in our work, we wanted to go a step further and say, well, look, we kind of understand fossil fuels are known for not being very just. But what about pro-climate interventions? What about climate change mitigation? What about renewables or nuclear power? And so we embarked on a, a qualitative case study comparison here in Europe, where we, we chose four European transitions, partly because we were funded by the European Commission, and that was the remit for the project. It was called INAPATHS, Innovation Pathways for Decarbonization. But also because I think it gets you four really rich transitions. It gets you four transitions that happen in different times, and it gets you four transitions that involve different technologies, two on the supply side and two on the demand side. And the transitions are nuclear power in France, solar energy in Germany, battery electric vehicles in Norway, and that's a smart meter with an in-home display. We have smart meters uh, for electricity and gas here in Great Britain. And what's also interesting about these transitions is they're considered world leading in some way. The French nuclear rollout has been advocated as the template for other highly industrialized countries to pursue nuclear power. And France is by far the largest major economy now with 75% of its electricity from nuclear power. And it's the largest exporter of nuclear power in the world. Germany has millions of homes that have adopted solar PV. So it has the largest per capita use of solar in the world, far ahead of even China or the United States. Norway is the by far the world leader for battery electric vehicles. Last year, 70%, 70% of new car sales were only BEVs. And the size of their per capita market is 50 times bigger than China's, which is the world's largest market by mass volume. And the Great British smart meters rollout is different than the one in the US because it's a mandatory rollout that will see 56 million smart meters deployed uh, by 2024 to all homes and small businesses. So again, four very big transitions that are often studied, but very rarely connected to, to justice. So we embarked on this kind of mixed methods, qualitative research design, uh, where this is where social scientists go around. We love to do what are called interviews. And so we did 64 expert interviews. And again, I'm quite pleased, I'm quite surprised actually that we got access to such good stakeholders because we didn't hide our objectives. These stakeholders knew we were coming to talk about injustice. And yet we still had access to the Atomic Energy Commission in France or EDF, who's their big supplier, or the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Germany, or the German Solar Association, or the Ministry of Transport in Norway, or the Department of Energy in the UK. So we had unprecedented access to what I think are some of the best, most knowledgeable experts about the transitions. But because expert interviews have a bit of tension when you talk about justice issues, because these experts are elites, and so they might be missing perspectives from ordinary people, lay people, or especially marginalized groups. So we didn't want to only rely on experts. So the second thing we did is we did what are called focus groups uh, with ordinary members of the public with a small incentive. I think we bought them lunch uh, or a, you know, a cup of coffee. And while these interviews tended to be in the capital regions, lots of interviews in Paris and Berlin and Oslo and London, these we intentionally chose rural to peri-urban areas far away from the capitals, Lewis, Colmar, Freiburg, and Stavanger. Focus groups were great, but they also tend to give you consensus-oriented responses because everyone's in a group. And of course, the focus groups were limited in that only five to 10 people could come to each one. So we did a third method after the focus groups to try to cast a wide net to get people who weren't able to come to the focus groups, but were still members of the public to give comments, but also to give comments in a more private way. And as many of you know, nothing speaks about anonymity and privacy like the internet. And so we also joined internet forums that had more than 2 million members where they were talking about these transitions extensively, where we asked our same questions and collected a further 58 responses um, from this. So it's a nice design that gets you expert data with focus group data, with kind of anonymous public data from these internet forums. 
Well, that does put it into kind of a category of mixed methods research that tends to have better triangulation and better validity in the social sciences, it does have some weaknesses. The first is, even though we tried to get public input, our expert respondents still outweighed the public input. So there is a slight bias in our, in our data towards experts. Obviously, the research I'm about to show you is only hypercritical. We're only talking about what's wrong with the transitions. We're not talking about what's right with them. Due to all the data, we also did not have space in the research to do a lot of literature reviews. And so we're, we're giving you as a lot of empirical data, but not necessarily data that's been confirmed independently in other research. Um, we also didn't correct people. When we asked them what an injustice was, if they said, man, the biggest injustice to an electric vehicle is traffic jams. Well, you know, a traffic jam is annoying. I'm not sure it's an injustice. Or they were upset that maybe EVs were taking bus lanes. Um, that's very different than, say, someone dying from energy poverty in the cold, right? But we didn't correct them. So whatever they said was an injustice, even if it might be an annoyance or an inconvenience or not very serious, we respected it and we cataloged it in our inventory. To offset all of this, we did code everything and we also did frequency analyses. People don't always do this with interview data, but we did it to help give you a sense for how robust the evidence is and how often a justice claim came across the data. And I should say, like I said, we're very critical here. We have another paper you can see here, you can read it later, that does talk about the co-benefits, the positives. Because to get our interviewees warmed up, the first question we asked was, tell us what's good, tell us what's right about these transitions. And I'm happy to say we identified more co-benefits than injustices, so that's good. Okay, so what did we find? Like I said, we cataloged the data. We used for this study, the tenants approach. So we cataloged the injustices by four dimensions, distributive, procedural, cosmopolitan, and recognition. And you can see here, we also, frequency counted whether they came up in only a research interview, that's RI, or only a focus group, that's FG, or only an internet forum, that's IF. And this gives you them ranked by how often they came up. So you get a real sense for whether it came up once in some random interview, or it came up repeatedly and a lot. And this is where I would ask you if I was there in person, how many do you think we found? This shows you the first five distributive injustices for French nuclear power. And usually when I ask students, they'll say, maybe you found 20, or maybe you found 30, or maybe you found 50. No one has ever guessed correctly that in fact, we found 120, almost as many injustices as co-benefits, 128 co-benefits in the other paper, 120 injustices. And what's very interesting, distribution is, by far the most frequent type, which is fair because it's about costs and benefits. And there's a whole literature, cost benefit analysis even in economics is kind of an element of distributive justice. But it's very troubling that for us, the second most significant was recognition, which implies that after distribution, these transitions are creating impacts among the most vulnerable groups in society, the homeless, the disabled, single parent families, et cetera. What was also quite shocking to us is that somehow smart meters had the most number of injustices, more than nuclear power, which I'm still wrapping my head around. But again, this could be both related to the culture, maybe people in the UK like to complain more than people in France, but also the kind of technology styles. I think smart meters are more invasive into people's homes, the rollout's more recent, uh, so people maybe get, there's just concerns about health and radiation and monitoring and privacy. Whereas in France, there's a culture of kind of acceptance of nuclear power because it's been there for three decades. And so it could also be that's what we're picking up on with the cultural differentiation in our response rates, not that smart meters are per se more or less just. But it's interesting is that even though these numbers are, are, are significant, they're roughly the same. I mean, we still see 20% of the injustices with solar and a high of 28%. So all of the injustices are kind of evenly distributed among the four different transitions. One of the questions we asked in the interviews wasn't just tell us about the injustices, it was also tell us about an injustice that may occur outside of the transition. As in, we're here talking about 
electric vehicles in Norway, but can you think of an injustice beyond Norway? And we were quite shocked at how frequently our data pointed to global externalities or global injustices that happened well beyond the case in question. And to kind of capture them, we developed this whole systems framework which looks at different temporalities, different life cycle stages, manufacturing, consumption, and disposal. This is again, fitting with Healy and their multi-scale or embodied justice framework. And we also wanted to look at different scales from like the local community scale to the kind of meso national scale. And like I said, the transnational or global scale. And again, I'm still shocked. We identified something like 70, injustices from these transitions that proliferated around the world. Whether it was respondents telling us that the transitions were interfering with Canadian tar sands or the Keystone XL pipeline or coal exports from Peabody from the US or creating impacts on lithium mines in South America or e-way scrapyards in Ghana or cobalt mining in the Congo or the disruption of LNG markets in Australia, or low wage manufacturing for solar panels in China, or the erosion of profits for Gazprom in Russia it circulates around the world. Which convinced us to do a second phase of the research because the first phase just got you this laundry list of injustices. And it would put things like interruption of property prices or traffic congestion or parking alongside things like death and human rights abuses um, and uranium mining. And those are very different things. So we embarked on a second phase of research that wasn't justice focused in terms of getting a long list, it was community focused. We chose a particular community and went there to deal and try to capture their lived experiences with these transitions. So it was a community centered approach rather than a justice centered approach. Although we were of course still talking about justice. And we chose four communities, one per each case. French wineries, which are having difficulty because they're often sited next to nuclear power plants. Uh, German solar manufacturing, and I'll explain why that we chose manufacturing in a moment. Uh, that was for German PV. Uh, E-waste for smart meters, and we ended up going to Ghana because it turns out that 70% of electronic waste from the UK ends up in Ghana, which is a former colony. And we chose for EVs, cobalt mining, where we went to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, Lubumbashi and Kowizi um, to visit cobalt mines, uh, which supply critical materials for the batteries used in almost all mass market battery electric vehicles. And again, sticking with our mixed methods design, we did expert interviews, we did community interviews. Yes, I sent a poor French research fellow to French wineries to speak to winemakers and wine growers and residents. And I spoke myself to Congolese cobalt miners and artisanal miners and traders and the mining police. And we talked to scrapyard workers and their families and solar workers and union leaders and you know foremen and even mayors of towns that have seen the collapse of solar energy manufacturing. So again, we got extremely lucky with our data selection. And then because this was much more an intimate data collection process, we did a lot of field research. So we visited, my poor French research fellow, seven vineyards, one wine cellar, one archive, one winemaking fair. Although he also visited three nuclear power plants. So I guess there's a bit of a, a trade off there. And yes, my German colleagues visited eight solar manufacturing sites in communities. And then I led the teams that visited 20 scrapyards in Ghana and 30 different mining sites or affiliated processing centers in Sub-Saharan Africa in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the results of this research are quite troubling, if I can be honest. In terms of French wineries, right? Um, we have a huge concern because these wineries need microclimates to stay the same and they need water. And usually the introduction of nuclear power changes both. Nuclear is thermoelectric power that usually changes water temperature and it also changes the microclimate. And then you have periodic incidents where the media becomes concerned there might be tritium or other elements in the water supply. Uh, and, you know, and winemakers have said that we've made mistakes. It's been a mistake thinking that we could cohabitate very peacefully with the nuclear industry. And look at this, there have been particular 
regions of France that have seen a 40% loss of sales. And many of these are small to medium enterprises that are living on the margin. And so the fact that they may lose almost half of their sales after any, a particular nuclear incident could devastate them. They go bankrupt and lose this heritage of theirs that has existed for thousands of years. And this just goes to show you how close the vineyards get to the nuclear infrastructure. This is well within the 20 kilometer exclusion zone the IAEA recommends for accidents. This is the Triscotin nuclear facility and the Triscotin uh, winemaking appellation. And again, as one of the winemakers said, can you imagine if this was on the bottle of wine, would anyone ever buy it? Probably not. The German case is a bit trickier because we never would have guessed when we did the first phase of our research that German workers themselves were a vulnerable population. And yet here's one of the quotes from the expert interviews. The rural vulnerable group from the solar transition is not the coal miners or the nuclear plants that have shut down. It's the 100,000 solar workers who lost their jobs. And Germany got all upset and involved in protecting their coal workers, but they kind of let the German solar workers go. And so you have this respondent here saying, the German solar workforce was a vulnerable population. They were not protected. There was no just transition, skills retraining, or remediation to help them. Or in the words of a local mayor, Berlin got the electricity, and we got the ashes. And that becomes very apparent when you start to visit some of these communities where you see just the complete shutdown of manufacturing and these it kind of abandoned industrial landscapes that not only are no longer providing revenue, but they're also uh, creating liabilities for the municipalities who have to send police there, who have to watch for vandalism, who have to you know kind of maintain the land, maintain the lighting. Uh, and I've also lost things like pensions and tax revenue um, and kind of community support. Many of them are vandalized, which means they have to be repaired. Um, and this is just goes to show you where one of the world's major manufacturers, Q cells, used to be within the Sun Park. Q cells has since almost gone bankrupt and has seen their workforce contract by, I think, a factor of 10, right? And so you have mass unemployment and labor instability in these parts of Germany which is quite tragic because the German feed-in tariff for solar energy was designed to promote industrial strategy and growth and jobs. And what it ended up doing is creating certain regions of Germany, especially this one in Eastern Germany, that have just been further left behind now outside of the sunlight of Berlin and Stuttgart. The third one was from smart meters. This is showing you the impacts of electronic waste. And again, Thousands of people live in this scrapyard in poverty. You have young children as young as six who are engaged in this business. They look for scrap. They do hazardous kind of working conditions. This one talks about a boy who died at the age of 12. Um, and I saw this myself when I visited. You see five or six children sleeping on bricks. They don't even have a pillow or a blanket and they work 10, 12, sometimes 18 hours a day. And this gives you a sense for where a lot of the e-waste ends up. This is in Ogbogwashi, which is near Accra. And again, that black smoke is very hazardous, very carcinogenic, because they're burning a lot of the e-waste to get to the copper and the gold inside a lot easier because it melts out of those products. And then you have ethnic minorities, usually from Togo or Benin or from the northern part of Ghana, who have the worst jobs. They have to go through the smoldering ruins and pick up the scrap after it's been burnt. And if you've got really good eyes, you might see this kind of white thing in the middle of the photo. It's not a human, it is a cow. And that cow is indeed full of milk and that milk will be consumed. When I visited, I also saw religious leaders walking around with chickens and the occasional pig. Uh, and so this also shows you the kind of exposure of toxicity, right? People are directly ingesting all of the metals and hazardous materials in that waste through these types of, of, of work streams. And look at the water behind the cow. They drink from that river. There's no water filtration. There's no bottled water. Um, and so this often explains why life expectancy in this part of Ghana is less than 40 years of age. And it has the highest rates of things like neonatal disorders, birth disorders, and other kind of young um, kind of diseases among children in all of this region of Africa. 
it also explains tragically why community exposure to toxins is higher than worker exposure, which is another injustice because the workers go home at night, but the community members have to live here. When I visited it, I saw a school and a mosque and a soccer field on top of the waste, right? And so you've got young children living in these types of hazardous conditions for almost every minute of their life. And then the final one is related to EVs, and this is, is cobalt mining in the southeastern part of the Congo, which has been called the geological scandal because it's got so many resources. Even uranium here was used in the Manhattan Project, so there's a long tradition of the Belgians and the French and others exploiting the Congo for its mineral reserves. And again, you have this very troubling quote, artisanal scale mining for cobalt is not living, it's dying. The moment you step inside the mine, the clock starts ticking. You have dust, silicosis, mercury. You can drown if it gets flooded. You can get trapped if the mines collapse. You can get crushed by rocks or even get diseases because people will shit and piss inside the mine. Um, there is even cases of the plague being spread because rats get into the mines, right? You can see this quote here. It is an underground circus full of animal and human excrement. And even then, if you don't die, you can still fall sick or be disabled or dismembered or you disappear into the jungle after you maybe hurt your arm or your leg. And this just shows you how low tech artisanal mining for cobalt is. This is a miner that we captured near Colweezy, where you can see, look at, they're not even wearing shoes. They took off their flip-flops there in the bottom of the photo. Um, they're not using a shovel. They're not using a respirator or a mask or PPE, there is no ventilation in that mining shaft. There's no lighting, they have to use a headlamp and there is no structural support. There's not even a ladder. He's literally climbing into holes in the rock and he will be in there mining cobalt by hand without any type of, of mechanical tool for seven to nine days until he comes out with a sack of cobalt that he can sell to a trader. And these are just the actual active miners. You have a whole secondary system of artisanal mining where children like these five-year-olds and seven-year-olds will pick through mine tailings, which are also carcinogenic because there's uranium and trace elements of other materials in many of the mine um, tailings. You also see these types of miners being chased by the police, beaten, drowned, uh, abused as well because they're sneaking onto mining concessions outside of the security perimeter to try to get the materials before they're caught. And this also shows you another seven-year-old cobalt trader who's bringing a sack of cobalt to one of the Chinese trading depots um, near Lubumbashi. So to conclude on that very depressing note, what are we to make of these trends? Well, I think the first one is low carbon transitions are things we need and we, we want them. Even with these critiques, we are not saying stop the transition. Right, But we are trying to say these are not winner-win transitions. They're not net beneficial for everyone. They do result and are connected to gender abuse, patriarchy, environmental destruction, and a lot of injustice, whether it is through things like cobalt mining. And this just shows you the multiple pathways of environmental destruction from cobalt mining. This shows you the multiple pathways for things like e-waste manufacturing, Sorry with the diagrams, we, we drew them ourselves. <laughs> it's multiple exposure points at multiple parts of the process and life cycle with multiple impacts on communities and workers and the environment. It's also quite troubling to us that a lot of these injustices were not just the kind of evil centralized power plants. It's not just nuclear, right? We also see solar energy, which is usually depicted as key to energy democracy as being implicated in these trends, as well as end use devices like smart meters, in-home displays, batteries, energy storage, distributed generation, right? And what's quite tragic is that these are many of the innovations we're using to fight energy poverty in the global north, right? We need solar in ethnically or racially disparate populations in the US and our urban areas. And we need things like energy efficiency and smart meters to help combat fuel poverty in the UK. And so it's this really weird situation of like pitting poor groups in Africa against poor groups in the global north. And the third finding is it's not just about technology. There are lots of procedural or policy injustices that are based on governance. So there may be less about the technology and more about how the technology is governed and implemented, 
right? And so, for instance, are the issues with solar because so something wrong with solar, or is it really the way that the Germans made their feed-in tariff calibrated to promote middle-income families and people who had homes and roofs? If you were homeless or if you rented, you couldn't participate. And you also had to have good credit scores. So if your credit was at risk, you also wouldn't get a loan to actually buy a lot of the materials, right? So it tended to be financially exclusionary. That kind of ad old adage that bankers only want to give money to those who don't need it. Same sort of thing. The feed-in tariff reflected middle to upper income socio-demographic profiles. Maybe there's not much wrong with smart meters, but the way they did it in Great Britain has been weird. We did not do it neighborhood by neighborhood or through the network operator. We instead did it by suppliers. And that may sound good, but the UK energy market is like Texas's. It's a deregulated, re-regulated market that has 88 energy suppliers. And guess what? They all have different meter types. And if you switch suppliers, they stop working. So this kind of way of doing a, a supplier-led rollout caused a lot of friction and problems and tension with redundancies and different meter marks and a bunch of other aspects that maybe wouldn't have happened if they designed it a bit differently. Nuclear power in France is not like it is in places like the United States where the NRC is pretty good and the GAO are pretty good at publishing reports that talk about incidents. It's much more secret in French. No one gets a lot of the data. And so again, maybe nuclear would be a lot better if you had more information, but the fact that it's kind of, it's so secret and they threaten the kind of national security restrictions on nuclear debates uh, also means that maybe that authoritarian style of doing nuclear is what a lot of people took issue with rather than light water reactors or nuclear power per se. And the same way in Norway, their electric mobility program privileged cars. And it also tended to privilege Teslas and kind of sports cars, like the Roadster, right? And we had one kind of planner say, well, look, the subsidy that a single Tesla owner gets in Norway is equivalent in tax write-offs to 30,000 bus tickets. So there's an example of an elitist approach to low carbon policy, right? Because it benefits one car owner when it could have benefited 30,000 other people riding low carbon mass transit. Um, so again, this really underscores the non-technology side of these transitions and kind of the policy regimes that they're embroiled in can also perpetuate and aggravate these types of injustices. The cosmopolitan and multi-scalar concerns also remind us very troublingly that many of these injustices proliferate. They spatially multiply. For nuclear power, I didn't talk about all these, it includes the kind of exportation of French nuclear designs that may not be very efficient to uranium mining. I think French nuclear power receives uranium from Namibia and Niger and Kazakhstan, in addition to Canada and Australia. And we haven't even talked about nuclear waste. For solar, um, you see waste streams proliferating from solar energy around the world. And you see a dependence on low wage manufacturing in places like China or Malaysia, if you're actually going for thin film solar PV. You see for um, things like smart meters, you require copper and cobalt for the batteries and you have e-waste flows that go to Ghana. And for EVs, you see their dependence on lithium and cobalt and other rare earth minerals. And something I didn't talk about as well, um, where do you think the fossil fueled cars go when someone buys an EV? They don't just disappear. You see a lot of those vehicles leaving Norway, ending up in Poland or Estonia or even Sub-Saharan Africa. Finally, I'm quite concerned. So I do a lot of work on the sustainable development goals. Uh, before this, it was sustainable energy for all um, and the millennium development goals of which energy was kind of a meta uh, millennium development goal. So I'm someone who does believe that clean energy and renewable energy are a, a human right. But at the moment, I'm very troubled that securing it creates too many trade-offs with other human rights, uh, which leads to this sort of green on green conflict or poor on poor conflict. And I'm very disturbed that kind of a, a truly just energy intervention may not be possible. It may always have to have injustices somewhere. You can't eliminate them. You can only redistribute them. So it may be this really nasty case of picking winners and picking losers, picking who that will be, and then targeting interventions um, to help ameliorate them. And then the final thing is, I think conceptually, this comes back to the value of multispatial work and multiscalar work. 
we need conceptual approaches that avoid this divide of only looking at where a technology is used. We need to unpack its life cycle assessment beyond to look at flows of materials and manufacturing and processing, and transportation and waste. And as long as we don't do that, we risk masking the impacts of these transitions um, that will only aggravate all of the impacts that I've just talked about. And with that, I'm very happy to, to stop talking and open it up for questions, Lucy. Over to you. Hi, Dr. Salvaco. Yeah, please uh, have a cup of your tea. Um, I saw a lot of interesting questions. Let me admit, actually, there's still a uh, participant want to join in. Um, very interesting talk. And I would like to have the Q&A being interactive. So I would like to have uh, uh, the audience who ask questions uh, unmute yourself and just directly ask your questions. Um, how about that? Uh, Michael, do you want to start your questions? Sure. Um, excellent talk. And uh, thanks for spending some time with us. Um, I have a lots of lots of questions, uh, but I will try not to hog the podium here. Um, and um, and I'm sure that actually going through and reading the papers would help tremendously to help us kind of think through this. We are really looking in Texas at this transition. We see that Texas is transitioning faster than any other state in the US, mainly because we have an independent grid. And these are all things you know. Um, and, and so one of the, so one question that maybe to get the conversation started is, have you done a side-by-side -side comparison between a fossil fuel dominated energy system, which is what we've been using historically versus uh, the sort of the optimum mix of fossil and renewable versus a renewable only? And, um, and, you know, and, and bearing in mind that there are many different um, parameters that we could try to optimize. Are we really looking at global health? Are we looking at carbon emissions? Are we looking at cost? Are we looking at accessibility and so on? And, um, and that's probably an entire career's worth of, of uh, questions, but I'll, I'll stop there before I, before I keep going. No, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm trying to get to a study we just had released actually this week where it, it, it answers that question indirectly. It doesn't use justice terminology, but we use externalities. So externalities mm -hmm. are basically social and, and economic or environmental costs, which can include injustices, but other ones as well. And we did a global synthesis of evidence across hundreds of studies and almost a thousand different estimations because people are trying to monetize asthma, pollution, job disruption, water consumption, et cetera, across these different supply chains. And for the energy sector, we end up calculating that externalities, if you use the mean numbers from this data, are, are between kind of 10 to $12 trillion a year with a, t with a T. So they're incredibly large, but there's a huge range based on the technologies. And it's kind of what you said. This is a kind of proxy of determining which technologies have the most social harm versus those that don't. Um, and let me share quick switch my screen. I will share with you the, the, the diagram that shows you where all these different energy systems sit. And to prepare you for it, basically there are two outliers that tend to have the most harm. So these are the two that you would say you don't want in your energy mix. They are coal, but also waste to energy. Uh, there are a bunch that are kind of in the middle that are like moderately harmful. This would be where you would put things like natural gas, hydroelectricity, nuclear power, and even a little bit of solar, I think. And then there are a bunch of them at the bottom that are actually considered to have the least externalities. So here's the study. Sorry if you're gonna get dizzy. And here's the diagram I'm talking about. So waste and coal are by far the worst. This red dot is the mean. So actually waste to energy has more externalities than coal, although that's not accounting for a lot of the ranges. Oil, gas, fuel cells are kind of in the middle. And then you've got all of these options here, bioenergy, geothermal, hydro, nuclear, solar, and wind that have the least damages. So I think that these will differ based on the regions because obviously this, these are globally mean numbers. But I think that's how you should design your portfolios. You should, you should put together them into mixes that have the least social harm. And what you can do, because this is just social cost, you can actually combine this type of thinking with levelized cost so that you have like the cost of making energy and the social cost to get something closer to the full cost. And we did it here. And again, I'm sorry for making you dizzy. 
to be at the bottom here, where this shows you globally, at least, when you add levelized cost to social cost, the least costly to most costly options. So it does kind of imply at a very generic level, we want energy mixes that are geothermal, solar, hydro, wind, gas, fuel, PV, and nuclear. And we want to kind of get rid of oil, coal, and waste. And so are you including, um, are you somehow monetizing envir the environmental part along the supply chain? And I'm thinking about, uh, for example, uh, wind and solar, we know are not very dense energy systems. And so they require more land. And how do you account for the larger land area and the impacts of that? Are you able Absolutely. to do that? So in this study we did, you can see here are all of the types of externalities that we tracked. And you can see land is there under LD for land degradation, mm -hmm. as well as water, species loss, et cetera. So the externalities study did it for sure. Um, and by the way, for those of you that want the study, it, it is open access and it, it's got a kind of very accurate title <laughs> called the hidden costs of energy. Um, but we've also done what's really interesting and this is perhaps even more relevant for Texas. Uh, we do a lot of industrial PhDs in Denmark because I have another affiliation there. So people are working with industry and we got phenomenal access a few years ago to the wind energy supply chain for a major manufacturer, one of the top two in the world. I can't tell you which one. And we conducted an environmental profit and loss. So we looked at when you make wind turbines in their supply chain, as well as by material, as well as by component, nacelle, blade, hub, uh, foundation, tower, and all of that, where do the externalities occur? Um, and I'm happy to share it with you later because that pinpoints within the supply chain exactly the spaces in which you need to actually reduce harm. And what was quite interesting about that study was, well, actually it's foundations and towers account for most of the damages from wind, but also same sort of thing, this multi-scalar issue, 70% of the externalities for wind farms in Northern Europe happen outside of Europe. They're happening in China and Korea where a lot of the components are being made and even things like concrete are being shipped. So it also reveals that um, oftentimes at the wind farm is not where most of those externalities are happening. They're happening at other parts in the supply chain. And we talk in the article and I can share it about ways you can optimize the supply chain to minimize that. But this is exactly the sort of research we need because we did that study on wind, but what about solar? What about nuclear? What about coal? So I think that that type of work would be very useful to complementing the very qualitative work we've done here. Great, thank you. I'll be in touch, I'm sure, outside Please of this do. meeting. Uh, let me jump to Ramon's question. I think Ramon's question is related to this paper. Ramon, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Um, I, I apologize beforehand because I wasn't able to join the, your, your talk until a few minutes into it. So you may have addressed this, but I was wondering um, in that uh, paper that you just showed us, uh, do the levelized costs of the fossil fuels uh, include CO2 mitigation, uh, CCS? Not, not usually. No to CCS. And so for those levelized costs, you can get them from a variety of places, the IEA, ARENA, EIA, Energy Information Administration. We're yeah. using Jacquard's. So, or Lazard's, not Jacquard's, Lazard's. Lazard's publishes an LCOE every year, and they usually publish it with policy incentives and without policy incentives. We were using the one without policy incentives. Um, but yeah, that, so we were just relying on someone else's LCOE. So it doesn't normally include the cost of CO2 mitigation. That would probably be the one that is with policies. And then it will depend greatly on your local policies, whether you have carbon taxes or other types of instruments. Thank and you, if you uh, want, Jay. If you don't, I'm mm -hmm. happy to put um, the link to Lazards right into the chat so you can check it out later on. They update the LCOE numbers every year. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jay, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I just, uh, Benjamin, thank you very much. A really interesting talk. It gets you thinking about things. Who? Wh where do you get funding to, to do this type of thing? I, I bet that's quite a challenge. It is, and it's kind of sad because before I came to Europe, I worked at Vermont Law School, which is in the US. And I've never had a dip more difficult time raising money because like Vermont Law School is all about pro poor, right? Weatherization, energy efficiency. It's like the things that don't make a lot of money, unlike oil and gas or, you know, and it was a law school that only worked on the environment. So we didn't have these big kind of philanthropic people who had made a lot of money litigating in court or working in corporate law or patent law. 
And so it was really, really got a sense for like the more important the justice issue is, the less funding there might be to look at it. So we've been very, very lucky. The particular research that I presented has been funded by the European Commission. And the European Commission has a platform that's about to end called Horizon 2020. And Horizon 2020 is unique because it's not disciplinary, it's challenges based. So they'll have a challenge. And this challenge was how do we decarbonize Europe? And then everyone puts together proposals that want to study that topic uh, very intimately. And ours won because we had this whole theme on equity and justice. Uh, and I should say, it's not just me. We have a whole other set of work done by um, modelers using global equilibrium models that talk about income and how income changes as you create more progressive climate policy. So it's, you know, we're as very qualitative. That's very much looking at econometrics and all that. So I could point you to that team. It's E3M or ECM, I think, in Greece are the people who lead that part. And we also work with PIC and EASA who use integrated assessment modeling. So it's a kind of a nice complement to the very qualitative stuff. But Horizon 2020 has been fantastic. We've got five different projects now, including one with looking at energy justice in the Arctic. We have one looking at energy justice in carbon intensive regions, Poland, Estonia, Greece, et cetera. So I think it's been, it's been really a boon for energy justice work. So what happens after 2020? Then they create um, Horizon Europe. Okay. <laughs> it's the next phase, yeah. So at least it's still going on. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jay, for your question. Um, Mark, your, your question is next. Yeah. Your Benjamin, I, I really enjoyed your talk. And I, I have to say, I was a little bit skeptical uh, coming into this. Um, but, you know, it's, I, I think, uh, <laughs> your approach is very good. And, you know, you, you talked about extern, externalization. Uh, you know, I, I use the term NIMBY or not in my backyard. That, that seems to be a real driving undercurrent. I'm not, I, I'm really curious about your opinion, your, your own personal view on how much you know, NIMBYism is, is driving a lot of this. Is, you know, it, out of sight, out of mind, then it's okay to move forward with you know, whatever form of energy is. Is that your sense or you know, is it, it just a matter of education where it, maybe if people really understand some of the impact elsewhere that they would change their views. Anyway, I would appreciate your comments on this. Great, great question, Mark. And I wish I had an easy answer to you. The, the NIMBY debate has gotten quite complex and kind of interesting um, because you find that when people do say they don't want something, their reasons for NIMBY could be very diverse. They could be political. They don't like the planning process. It could be economic. They felt that there weren't enough benefits to the community. It could be aesthetic. They don't like how they look. Um, it, it could be political. Oh, I don't believe in climate change, so I'm not going to support this weird wind farm that's being pushed for climate reasons. And so like, you kind of have this confluence of factors, and, and some people find certain factors compelling and others don't. And there's been really good work that could, you know, unpacks NIMBY into like 30 different dimensions. Um, what's interesting is I have seen work that NIMBY changes as in before a project and right at the start of a new project, it's the fiercest, then it tends to fade away as people get normalized to it. I've also seen good work on proximity. So as you move further away from the site, of course, nimbyism kind of decreases because it is like you say, out of sight, out of people's mind. And the final thing is there's a, a sociologist named John Axon who has a really neat framework that talks about low carbon technology and why people like it or hate it. So it's, you know, kind of the attributes of low carbon systems. And I, I really, it's really neat, it's a quadrant and he says, a lot of our work, so you have um, private and public themes, and then you have functional and symbolic. And too much of the work is in that quadrant of, of private, functional. What will the technology do for me? Will it make my life better? Will it make me money and all of that? And he says, there are these other hidden dimensions, one of which is um, private symbolic. What does the technology mean to me? What does it represent like an EV? You might like not because it has anything to do with cost, but because you feel green, or maybe you don't like the uh, oil companies and you want to kind of say, I'm getting off of oil, or maybe you don't like the Iraq war. And this is your statement of not driving a car based on those. And then you have a whole other plane of things in the societal dimension, uh, where it's more about kind of um, what it might mean, not to an individual, but collectively to society or your state or your community, as in, well, I don't personally like wind energy, 
but I'm going to say it's okay because I want what's best for Texas, sort of kind of communal values. And I like that because it plots those values into different quadrants. And it just underscores that, you know, I guess I hate this answer, but it depends whether someone will resist a technology or not will depend on, in many cases, on those different factors. Great, thank you. Uh, oh, next, um, sorry. Next, quick, quickly too, if you want, I'm happy to share with you the acts and stuff. There's also been good work on psychology and we have a leading uh, environmental sociologist and psychologist in Europe whose name is Linda Stegg. And she also has a nice typology of values and these values map on Tom Dietz and Paul C. Stern in the US also do a lot of this. They've developed value belief norm theory but it's also quite good at showing you like the 20 to 30 different values that people have. And usually it's a conflict of values. Some are biospheric, you know, some are altruistic. Some people are more interested in their self, they're egoistic. So you have these kind of different dimensions of values and what really drives people. And that's just as helpful, I think, as Axon's way. It's like two different lenses that view similar things. Sorry, Lucy. No problem, very interesting. Uh... I'm stunned by your answers, actually. Uh, <laughs> so next question is from Bridget. Uh, do you want to uh, um, yeah. unmute um, uh, Incredible talk and uh, really informative. Looking forward to reading your papers. So uh, one of those plots that you showed after your presentation suggested that bioenergy was uh, plotted on the uh, low impact side. And I, I was surprised. Uh, I mean, we've looked at sugarcane in Brazil and we talk about uh, corn and soybeans in the US. And so I was wondering if you could comment uh, why it scored so well. Yeah, great question. Um, we do luckily have in those tables, in the study, a whole supplementary file that shows you all of the studies and all of the estimates you get into the assumptions. So you can see what methods they're using. Is it willingness to pay, hedonic valuation? Is it some other synthesis? Um, you can also see what was included and excluded. My guess would be that maybe the literature was a little optimistic on biofuels, or maybe it was talking, this is another thing we critique the literature for. A lot of the literature assesses state of the art. It doesn't assess real world, 40 year old technology or like first generation. So it could be a lot of studies that were like cellulosic ethanol, right? The promise where they're giving you really good externalities numbers because they're presuming state of the art, perfect technology being deployed. I think the other one, though, is also that don't forget just even though bioenergy might have fertilizer input and might have other issues with water use, it's probably still fractions as bad as things like coal or oil, you know, especially in terms of climate. Um, so that's the other thing is I think if in terms of type of externality, I think carbon dominated the sample. So that's gonna also be like local issues like local pollution and, and water are there, but they're not. Carbon is getting you a lot of those damages. And so they're probably pushing coal and the fossil fuels further along those axes to be more damaging. Thanks. Final thing I forgot to say, we do talk about mobility in the study, but we only talk about it in terms of transport mode. So we don't say biofuel versus fossil fuel, but it's more like road travel versus aviation versus rail versus freight versus marine shipping. And then we do confirm that uh, road travel is like the worst thing you can do. Uh, and that obviously taking train or walking or cycling is much better. So it could also be that some of the fuel impacts are built into some of those estimations of traveling by car, by road, independent of whether it's diesel or biodiesel or ethanol. Um, but it could also be that those numbers are showing up there in the other part of the study. And the transport externalities are greater than the energy sectors. Transport is about 14 trillion. So they're all like 20 to 30% higher, which is also very interesting because I would have guessed that energy is worse than transport, but it's not the case. Thank you. Um, I think Michael Young, Michael, you might have more questions. Sorry, I didn't see them. Um, do you want to continue your questions? Yeah, I'll just ask you a quick question. And I, I, I agree that um, we work with the Nature Conservancy and they have a development by design program that actually looks at the values of individuals and how to, how to sort of force rank them and combine them in ways so that local communities are a little bit more accepting of these energy choices. And so that's been a very interesting part. Um, and so, no, I'll just kind of stop there and just sort of mention that we are, we're actually um, we're using these in West Texas right now as a, as a means of helping to kind of guide 
uh, some of the placement and locations of, of, of all of the transmission uh, that, that includes pipelines as well as power lines and, and the facilities themselves. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, in the end, it's really about people and the choices that people make. It isn't so much about the technology, it's adoption and acceptance. So that, that's a great point. And I know we're almost out of time. We're building a data set right now of case studies of community opposition against energy. Uh, and we're looking at three continents. We have Appalachia, we have five regions in Europe, we have India. And again, there it's the same thing. We see a third of our cases against low carbon technology. They're fighting against wind and solar and hydro and transmission lines. It's not just fossil fuels. So this kind of comes back to that notion of NIMBY. It's like people hate it, whatever it is. They just don't want it to be built. And I even remember this joke in the literature that said NIMBY, not in my backyard, has become banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything, which I kind of thought was, was apt. It's cute. <laughs> it's, it's cute. <laughs> All right, we are we are actually right at ten right now. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Benjamin uh, Sovaco. Again, we really appreciate you provide an interesting uh, perspective from social sciences, and I think as as geoscientists and as other uh, petroleum engineers or environmentalists, we never got to see uh, those type of study that often. And we really, really appreciate you share your, your views and your, your research with us. And so uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Take thank care. You. Thank, thank you, you Benjamin.